Thank you all for having me. Um, I, I won't stay too long between you and, and the first coffee break. Uh, thank you, Dale, for having me. I'm really excited to be here. And, and I want to tell you a story of um, one of the things that truly inspired me to leave my, my 10 years of investment management and, and do something you know, slightly crazy. And so I want to tell you the story of you know, Ardusat, and we're going to get to that in a second, and the power of open access. I think uh, Chris has done a phenomenal job in talking about the power of Moore's Law uh, driving accessibility to technology. And I want to elaborate a little bit on the open access that I think he pointed out already as well. So I want to tell you the story about um, a company. It was a relatively successful technology company, and they invented a new user interface for a rather common device. Now, the one thing that wasn't entirely obvious to them is like, how are consumers going to want to use that technology and that interface? So one thing they did is that, like, why don't we have an absolutely crazy idea? Instead of telling consumers how they're going to use our technology, why don't we go out and crowdsource the use of our technology? So they basically gave open access to their technology. They made it um, uh, very easy to access, and then let the world innovate. So they had uh, a microprocessor, uh, the device had four sensors, and it had this really, really simple user interface. And so they added an SDK, an API, and an app store. And uh, then they let the world innovate. And I think by now you're going to get a sense of what this you know, unknown technology companies that I'm talking about, um, and actually I'm talking about Apple. And the outcome was that over the course of just four years, the world generated over 850,000 applications for this device that has been downloaded, I think this morning it is um, 50 billion times, and generating um, you know, billions of dollars of revenue for the company. And I think that revolutionary aspect of we have a technology, but instead of telling people what to do with it, we let people figure out what to do with it. And that is like an aspect of, of crowdsourcing, of, uh, of open sourcing access to technology that really inspired me to do uh, with, a, with a bunch of friends that I met uh, uh, at uh, International Space University uh, and build, build a satellite. Um, so what we do is, same to, to them, they have like this interface, iPhone technology, there's Moore's Law, I think Chris talked about that, and some really, really creative applications that you couldn't even come up yourself. And so what we did with Arduset is, um, first of all, it's a crowdsourced project. So we put it out on Kickstarter last summer and say, we're going to have a satellite, and we fill it with Arduino processors, and uh, we're going to let you program and control it. Um, and that was pretty successful. We raised $100,000, which for normal space budget, where people think of billions of dollars, shouldn't get you very far, but it does today. So then what we said is, um, we make it an open platform, like our satellite here. That's like our engineering model. Um, the thing before is the first pictures that we took, literally three months after the Kickstarter campaign, our payload went into the edge of space and, uh, and took this picture here. Um, this is our engineering model. It's in our office right now. This is the flat top model. And those are our two satellites. Within 12 months of having the idea, within about seven months of being on Kickstarter, we have two fully built satellites. And so that you get a sense of, of the size of this, um, this is the physical size of a satellite. That's it. And this thing is going to fly, actually two are going to fly relatively soon. But we didn't stop there. We added an open development environment. So we have an out of the control center where you just go onto the internet and you see where the satellite is, you see your applications, and you see if any data that is available to you. There is a learning environment. You know, the idea was inspired by uh, Sebastian Thrun's AI class, in which I participated as well. And you get to learn everything you need to, to know about programming a satellite, from programming to physics to you know, team management, coming up with ideas. Um, and if this thing works. Um, and then you can program it online. So one thing that we took out of the Arduino processing um, environment is that downloading of software, right? So it's still quite a bit of downloading. Go to the web page and you download drivers and an IDE and stuff like that. And that is a hurdle. And you know, before Chris mentioned about bringing down the hurdle of access. So we took all of that out and created a website where if you have an account, you can take one of Dale's wonderful Arduino processes and you plug it in and you can program it without having to download anything. And then. We did the other thing as well. So we just released our API. There is an SDK, and there is even as an app store where you can sign up to become a developer 
for this application. So within a time, a time span of about 12 months, we took an area that was generally considered massively expensive and completely inaccessible for the public, space and space exploration, and basically open sourced it. So you have now a web page where you can go on and you can buy a little Arduset kit with a few sensors, and you can buy time on a satellite where we actually give you about a full week's time to control the satellite and run your very own application for 250 bucks. And we are trying to make even that cheaper. And what do you get for that? So this is our Artist at One. It's going to be launched in, in August 5th. And it has about 15 different sensors, some of which have never been flown on a device this size. And some of them are going to look really large when we look at it again in five years. And that Moore's Laws and the economies of scale from drones, from cell phones, from security and surveillance in general, is going to continue to drive down the mass and power factor of those sensors. And it has Arduino processors. And so one thing you see is we are fully taking advantage of those improvements. Our Kickstarter campaign had a camera that we threw out after two months and replaced it with a camera four times the size. Those satellites here have a certain type of um, Arduino processor, and one of them you're going to throw out and replace with an upgraded one, and the one you're going to launch in, in November just a few months later. So there is massive economies of scale is happening on Earth, but in space we are not taking advantage of them so far. The average technology of our satellites today is equivalent to a 486 PC running Windows 95. Raise your hand if you still use a 486 PC at home. Um, so that's what we do. We have a microprocessor, we have 15 sensors, we have a simple user interface. You just go onto the internet and log onto your satellite. You can write your code, you upload it to the satellite. We give you an SDK, we have an app store. We add Moore's Law, we talked about it, and then we crowdsource space exploration through open access. Now, what are some of the applications that we're thinking of? One of the things that I'm personally very passionate about is education and lowering the barrier and letting literally high school kids experience space exploration hands on. Because I think the story that Chris told about is how hard it is to get kids engaged in science today is absolutely true. The other side is also true. We as a country rely on finding ways to get them interested. We are short over a million graduates in those fields, science, technology, engineering, and math, just over the next few years alone. And part of the problem is, is because we think giving them a textbook is exciting. Well, if I have a choice, I mean, this is some of the applications here. If I have a choice of looking at a textbook picture, or if I have a choice of programming a satellite to measure Earth's magnetic field, I mean, you kind of like can figure out which one I'm going to be leading towards. But I think what is even more powerful is the experience that we would take this experiment, and when the kids actually write their application and measure the Earth's magnetic field, they're going to say, Ms. Jones, um, my experiment, it looks different than this picture here. And then you're going to find out that their experiment is correct and that this picture is actually wrong. Because this thing called the sun that is blown against the Earth's magnetic field. And so this kid has the experience that they can do something and that is smarter than a textbook. Right? But I think that's not the end of the story if you think of a constellation of satellites. And I think, um, uh, sorry, I forgot your name. You talked about you know, what a, a constellation of drones can do. If you think of a constellation of satellites, what they can do, that is following Moore's law so that you always have the most powerful processor out there. We can get eyes on disaster within minutes and not within days. We can have a way to have ships that are in struggle on the ocean get access to help when right now they don't have any access to land. We can help emerging market countries get a much better sense of agriculture, which is still a, their largest income source, the largest economic driver, and is really the key driver of them being able to feed themselves. So having ubiquitous real-time access to space 24-7 will dramatically change what we can do on Earth and what we understand about our, pla our planets. One last thing that I want to leave you with is um, we were lucky enough to be selected by NASA for their Space App Challenge um, a few weeks ago. And there was a group in, uh, I believe, Guatemala we've never heard of. And they came up with this really brilliant idea of one of our sensors to measure what percentage of Earth's landmass is covered in green. And so they wrote an application for our satellite 
to see how green is our planet and what can we do to make it more green. Thank you.